join the conversation. And uh, our first speaker is David. Great. So, uh, how do we turn on the? This is a bad way to start. What's? Uh, I was shown. I was shown how to get it to, to show. Um, the screen. Yeah, there's a little remote that I've lost somewhere. Oh, now it's on. Oh, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Terrific. <laughs> Terrific. Oops. Not that. Great. No problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Powerful move. So, hello. Uh, my name is David, and I'm uh, uh, with the, at Harvard with the Society of Fellows. I told Jonathan Aronson that it's a sybaritic excuse for scholarship. Uh, which, which it is. I think Peter uh, Monji overheard me, and I, that's not about this conference, Peter, although the wine was good last night. That's the society that's a sybaritic yeah. drinking club uh, excuse for a scholarship. Um, but I was so stimulated by uh, Wendy and Nigel's uh, presentations on the semantic web that I want to take five minutes, if, with your permission, uh, and go through something that isn't about uh, network power exactly, and present something else that I'm doing, which is a project uh, that is uh, not yet theorized, it's a practical project of uh, work in the world, so to speak, which is my night job uh, in synthetic biology. And I wanted to propose it, that I go through it very briefly, uh, because I want your feedback, not necessarily in the questions and answers, but I'd like you all to be aware of what we're doing, and if you have thoughts about it, and how it links up with networks and network power. I'd love that. So I'm going to, with your permission, and hope I'm not trying your patience, postpone this uh, presentation for five minutes and go through something I hope you'll find exciting, which is BioBricks Foundation. So, I'm a, and this is, this is a, not even less prepared than my official presentation, so hope you'll bear with me. The BioBricks Foundation is a not-for-profit. Uh, we're trying to develop a, an open source style platform for the emerging field of synthetic biology. Uh, synthetic biology is what, um, what bioengineering should be if bioengineering had uh, adopted engineering protocols, which is protocols and standard processes for uh, making biology an engineering discipline in the way that mechanical engineering or, uh, uh, or electronic engineering is. Um, but as people might know right now in biotechnology, you have vertical integration company by company so that the cell lines or the germ lines that people are using in Genentech may be very different from Emerus or other kinds of things. The reason for that is you don't have interoperability of parts. And so what the field of synthetic biology is trying to do is to create standardization of basic biological parts, what we call biobricks or biobrick parts, to have them standardized so that one person's biobrick parts can snap into and work with another, and you could actually get the economies of uh, scale and scope that you expect in an engineering discipline where you have standardization and interoperability of parts. And we're trying to do this in an open source style so that uh, uh, for all the good reasons that anyone wants anything open source. Let me just show you this thing here, which is MIT now operates a registry of standardized biological parts. <clears throat> and I'll just show you very briefly. So there's a registry of parts. If you go to the catalog of parts and devices, this does eventually connect up with the semantic web, I promise. It's not, it's not completely uh, irrelevant. You have a registry of parts. You can browse the parts by different types. These are, this is relatively technical for people who don't have much background in biology. We have promoters, ribosome binding sites, protein domains. These are all basically pieces of DNA or genes that have some particular function in DNA synthesis. And uh, let, me, let me show you sort of how it works. Um, I'll go down to, to browse parts by device and function. Suppose I want to get something that smells nice. I can go into the odor production and sensing. The name here, the name on the left-hand column is the name of BioBrick. Alpha was a, was a certain kind of assembly standard that we used initially. Uh, it do, what it does and the description of what it does and the length. Um, and if we go down, let's say wintergreen odor generator. I click on BioBrick part J45120. And you get a, uh, it's just coming up, a wintergreen odor generator. And it is a... It catalyzes the conversion of a precursor, salicylic acid, to make methyl salicylate, which has a wintergreen smell. And each of these little things here is a sign, a standardized kind of 
uh, representation of a different piece of the genetic puzzle that overall takes a precursor and produces something that smells like wintergreen on the right-hand side. So this part was designed, as you see at the top, by an MIT iGEM team. That's an international genetically engineered machine competition. We bring together college, high school, university students of all kinds. They have this big competition using open source biobrick parts. They make new biobrick parts. They give them back to the registry. The registry grows. It's been growing at an exponential rate in the way that all of these new networked fields grow at. And we're getting an open source uh, uh, standardized biological part collection. Um, all, of the, all of the data then that these parts that character, go into the characterization of these parts, and you can click on these different the promoters and the enzymes and the switcher enzymes and all this, and, you can ex and it can explain what the part is, who manufactured it, information about it, ultimately even genetic code data, genetic data. Um, and all of this is machine readable. So ultimately, you can, we want it to be able to be such that there be multiple databases of genetic, of genetic information that could all be cross-linked, and you could search it, maybe using the R, uh, RDF system, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and as DNA synthesis and sequencing, so the sequencing is the reading off the genetic code, synthesis is putting together a piece of genetic code, gets better. And as you dematerialize the process, so that you could have a, suppose you'd have a desktop sequencing synthesis machine, so like with laser printing, you could, you could basically get information, you dematerialize this whole process, this could just be a series of GATCs, it could be brought into your local machine, you could produce things on a decentralized distributed basis, you get biotech production on an open source model, all through a networked formulation that wouldn't be possible. Um, I think uh, Bruno mentioned sensors uh, for pollution and so on. Imagine sensors, you have bio sniffers that look for either good or bad biological agents in the atmosphere. All that could be read back in real time. You could have groups of teams that actually respond to threats, uh, take advantage of ecological things that you want, health issues. It, it just changes everything. You can, I don't know whether it's Web 4.0 or Web 3.1, but where you, where you actually integrated the biological level into the uh, machine network. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's 3.1 or something. And, and, you, and you can imagine even giving your own genetic data into the machine, having groups of people work on it, uh, tracking similarities, producing individualized genetic medicines that actually work for you. There's all sorts of privacy and other concerns here, which obviously I'm aware of and don't want to go into but at this moment. But anyway, this is an interesting uh, thing. And ultimately, it could help us to, I think, getting back to my talk, develop what I hope later would be an integrated theory of biopower, which people remember from Foucault's uh, history of sexuality. He has a, a primitive theory, I think, of biopower. This, this is biopower plus network power on a global scale, and it, it represents huge promise and also huge, huge dangers. So with that little ado, I wanted to... So you're going to put all that out in RDF? I think, so. I think it may already be. I need to ask. I, I don't do any of, the, uh, any of the computing stuff, but the guy at MIT does, and so... It'd be great to sync up with you guys on this stuff because, uh, uh, okay, because, you know, who, who, not just publishing papers, but who's produced what biobrick yeah. part, who's tested it, who's been working with it, all of that valuable data would be great to be retrieved. Okay. There's also an effort to add clinical trial data. Yeah. It's parallel to what you guys Parallel to that. But that would be really useful. Absolutely. To to absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, great. So with that little... And if people have thoughts about that, just, just give me a holler. I'm on the board of the Biobricks Foundation now, so if people have, if people have a, a ton of money they want to give to a good open source project, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm accepting it. Um, okay, so uh, first I want to begin with a thanks, and a word of thanks, a word of apology, and a confession. The thanks is uh, to the conveners of the conference, Manuel, Peter, and Noshir. Um, uh, intellectually especially, I want to thank uh, Manuel for reaching out to me. It was an, an amazing act. I get an email from Manuel Castells, that doesn't happen every day, to a random graduate student, and, uh, uh, and he uh, engaged my work and asked me to be here, and it's just, uh, it's, it's uh, terrific. Uh, and also to Peter, who read an early draft of this presentation, it helped me enormously in thinking about good targets and, uh, and people to work with. And also to Melody, who, I don't know how many emails I've sent Melody, but We've become, you know, email pals through this process, so thank you, yeah. Um, and also to Dean Wilson and the USC School, of course. Uh, this is terrific, so. Um, the apology is this is unfinished speculative work. Uh, thank you for letting me try your patience. Um, the great things about my time slot are that I, is that I hope that you ate heavily and so are a little bit dulled by your digestion process. And uh, also, it's, I'm right before Manuel, so you can correct anything that I, I, I mess up here. Um, the confession is this is my first PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'm not going to explain how it is that I 
uh, ended up making my first PowerPoint presentation at a journalism school, but needless to say, this is a point of some embarrassment for me. Um, all right, so the approach I want to pursue here, I think, follows very much on the, um, on the work that Nosher, it follows along the lines that Nosher and, uh, and Peter uh, Lenardi were presenting with the multi multiple uh, dimensionality. And I want to look at multidimensionality and historical perspective. So the idea here would be that they're at a broad level. People have been interested in using a network typology to explain historical changes. Um, to a large extent, and we'll go through, through it later in the slides, that network typology is relatively static. It's, it is, uh, I guess, unimodal uniplex. And that makes it very hard to understand why there would be any dynamic shift from one sort of network structure to another. So that, that's the broad ambition. Everything that follows now is completely revisable but the, and, and probably mistaken in many different ways. I'd love your feedback on it. But the broad ambition is to think, well, if you get to multimodal, multiplex network analysis, we might be able to understand big historical shifts in a better way than if you have a static, sequential, you move from this kind of network to this kind of network to this kind of network. If instead we see any given moment in history as consisting of multiple overlapping networks in which the power dynamics are in contradiction and intention, you may be able to figure out why there's a motor, uh, a historical motor to drive one form into another. So that, that's the overall thought here. Uh, so some motivating questions. What kind of powers at work in the network society? How do networks structure power? Do different kinds of network structure power differently? Or to put it a different way, how do we get from the rise of the network society to communication power, which people know is Manuel's latest very interesting contribution? And uh, let, me, let me read one paragraph from the paper, which I think explains what I'm getting at here succinctly. Uh, theorists of the network society have rightly insisted on the plurality of the networks in which agents are enmeshed. And it's a feature of long-standing historical importance that agents are, uh, that the, you have multiple uh, networks with different kinds of agents, with different kinds of relations at different historical periods. Uh, what can theorists of the contemporary network society learn from thinking about those periods? It, if we have some sense of the historical antecedents to the network society, will that help us to get any information about the network society now? Will it change our view of it? Um, and so um, in this presentation, I'd like to try and address this question in light of an alternative typology of network structures. So I want to theorize uh, two different inquiries into the nature of the network society. The first is, what kind of power is at work in networks? And the second is, how can we understand that power in light of the historical, uh, historical development? Okay. So theories of power in the network society. Then we'll go through this network typology. I'll propose some historical antecedents to the network society, and then I'll end with some questions for further research. Okay, so I had a, a, a modest contribution to this network power argument with a book that I published in 2008. And there I tried to generalize the idea of network effects. So uh, Dean Wilson and Rahul Tongia's work on uh, the other side of Metcalfe's law is something that I did ha had in mind to some extent. Uh, I didn't develop it uh, in, in as elaborated a form as they did. But I kind of had this idea that coordinating standards and the standards and protocols, if you will, uh, but I don't just have it in the technological networks, but social networks and so on. So these standards are more valuable and greater numbers of people use them. That's the basic graphs that I think, as Rahul said, on, on various of these different laws, you'll end up with an increasing, uh, an increasing uh, value uh, as, a, as a metaphor. And then this dynamic, which I describe as a form of power, can lead to the progressive elimination of the alternatives over which free choice can be exercised among different networks. As one network grows to dominance, perhaps it edges out other networks, depending on some questions of the boundary conditions between networks. That was my sort of take. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, uh, for Dean Wilson and Rahul Tonga, if you want to criticize a work that t uh, rather naively supposes uh, a certain particular form of network structure and it always increases, you might want to take this on as a it might be a good uh, uh, site to... <laughs> so I, anyway, I've already received one correction, a helpful correction from Manuel, um, which is that he helped to distinguish, uh, which I failed to do, the different ways in which power might be structured through networks. And he, he actually has a typology in which my theory of network power is just one of a variety of ways in which power can be structured through networks. He has promised that he will address this to some extent in his talk. So I'm going to go rather, rather quickly through uh, his contribution and... Uh, refer specific questions about it to him later. But basically, um, I think there is an interesting typology there, and it's something I didn't spot, and I'm grateful for, for the help. 
Um, and, uh, but I think that these different kinds of power in relation to networks is the exact kind of thing that we'd be thinking about if we move to a historicization of different network types. So that's the, that's the main thing there. Uh, networking power, um, which I think he, he cites both Wilson and Tongi and also uh, uh, Karin's work on gatekeeping, network gatekeeping theory. Um, this is an exclusion inclusion power. I'll just go more quickly because I think you're going to be talking about this. Network power is uh, the power of the standards of the network over its components. So that's what I was trying to get at. Network power is the relation, it's, uh, it's this uh, general idea of power of imposing your will on another, but it's within the programmed goals of a given network. And finally, the most crucial form of power uh, follows the form of network making power. And there, Manuel distinguishes programmers who have the ability to reprogram networks in terms of the goals that they have, and switchers who ensure the cooperation. They're like linking nodes between different networks, and they help them work together. Hope I'm not stealing your thunder too much here. No, no, okay. Uh, so anyway, so with, that, with those ideas of power in mind, I want to turn to an historical typology. So there are two approaches, I think, here, and I think it's relevant to get some of this method stuff right. To thinking about social structures and history. There's a synchronic approach, which is, which is often how uh, a lot of social network analysis proceeds, where you sort of take a snapshot. And so some of the elaborate structures that you see mapped out there are very synchronic. It's a single snapshot. You're trying to figure out in a given instance in time what's going on with the actors in a given network. And for some kinds of questions, that's going to be very helpful. For other kinds of questions, it's going to be less helpful than if you can develop, if you can generate a diachronic approach in which you figure out how different snapshots change over time. Right, um, And so a historical approach, in fact, uh, suggests that actually we don't have structures, we only have processes. That a structure is what we think we're seeing when we take a synchronic approach to a process. Right? So and in, in some ways, I think there's a danger in a lot of social network analysis of supposing that the structures that we see when we take a snapshot of a process have some independent existence such that we can then translate them from one contextual process to another and assume that we're going to see the same structures at work. Sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. But an assumption that the structures uh, in some ways are, the, are where the action is, is savors too much of the platonic for my taste. Uh, I'm not sure that these forms instantiate themselves in the world. I think that we have ongoing processes that we try and analyze. And one of the ways of analyzing is by trying to hold time constant as a variable that sometimes helps and sometimes it confuses us. So the ambition here is to lay out an historical typology of societal structures uh, with regard to first, the way that they structure network, networking, network, to network making power. And second, then thinking about specifically why they would transition to each other. What forms of uh, internal dynamics are at play that might mean they structure to each other. Now I want to note here uh, a caution that Peter Taylor helpfully gave me yesterday on the bus, which is we don't want to fall into a progressivist account that presupposes any teleology, especially a progressive one that assumes that we're, history is a story of moving forward to some, uh, uh, in some uh, progressivist way. Um, at the same time, um, at the same time, there, there may be patterns that are not merely contingent. Um, and so that, that's, the, that's the tension. We don't want to fall into what, what he rightly called Victorian anthropology. Um, so if I end up falling that way, I hope you'll grab me <laughs> beforehand. Um, so in terms of how people have thought about this, uh, William Ucci, uh, Peter help helpfully pointed me to his work. So one way of getting at this, now again, we're, I'm looking here at the different kinds of structures that people have supposed are at play in different comparative analyses. Uh, he has a, a, an argument about markets, bureaucracy, and clans. Uh, they have normative requirements of reciprocity in them, but along different informational requirements. This is probably pretty familiar to people, uh, how it, he lays it out. It's, uh, it's kind of developing the transaction cost analysis of Williamson and ultimately back to Coase. Um, but uh, I'll move forward on that one. Uh, here you have, there's no photo needed here because uh, Woody Powell is right there for you all to see in, in, real, in real terms. Um, uh, market hierarchy and network, um, and I'll focus on this one a little bit more. Uh, this is from a very famous paper that probably a lot of people have looked at. Uh, distinguishing the market form, the hierarchy form, and the network form along different features uh, that they have. 
Can people see this in the back or is it too small? Is it, it may be a little... Yes, no, I know, that's why I say, I say, I say he's right there. Yes, no, that's why I say we don't need a photo of him. Uh, the other one I had a photo of William Mucci, but, uh, um, but can people, people read it? But basically, there's different forms, and they, have, they, they work in different ways. They, they, uh, okay. So some people have tried to, to explicitly historicize different forms. So this is from a book uh, by Lipnack and Stamps. They try and move through from small groups, so that's something more like the clan stuff that Uchi was talking about, through hierarchy, what they call bureaucracy, and to the networks. And in some idea, I don't want to particularly pick on Lipnack and Stamps, but some idea of this kind is very much abroad. It's, it's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of historical typologies that work like this, uh, and for good reason. The history, in some ways, shows some kind of a, a change, uh, and this is one way of thinking about organizing it. But specifically what's going on here I want to draw attention to is you've got these kind of network structure uh, typology that helps, that, that they imagine is going on in the transition from, say, small groups to hierarchies uh, to bureaucracy and then to networks. Uh, networks, of course, here is a, is a particular social form that they're theorizing, even though you could think of the network analysis as underlying all of the previous forms. And they link it up with different kinds of productive modes from uh, nomadic, agricultural, industrial, and informational mode. People have any questions about this stuff? Yeah. So, I haven't read this, but are they saying there were not kingship structures in nomadic? So, uh, trading networks. See that, see, that, see, that was interesting. So they're not saying, that, it's exactly right. There's a tension between identifying a, you're kind of stealing my, my punchline here, but that, that's good. There, there, there's a tension between identifying a network form at the end of some social evolution and a method of trying to understand uh, social relations on a network model. Uh, but, you know, give them that. Just say that, there, that there's, uh, um, well, we'll get into that. But I think that's a valuable thing. They're, they're, not, they're not saying that, but they recognize that there are, uh, tribe-like features, uh, sorry, network-like features in tribes. That's something that they do deal with. Um, the person who I think has the more, most advanced form of this, someone that Peter also put me on to, David Ronfeld. And I'll focus on this one because it's a little clearer than, than uh, the Stamps one. So, so he accepts that all of these are network forms, but then he wants to identify the network. How do you, we need to distinguish between understanding a social form along network lines and something like the network society. So the, here he's saying something, we have something like network society going forward in the future. But all of these could be kind of network forms, and he actually plays on that form of analysis. Uh, you have kinship and clans that he calls T or tribes, hierarchical institutions, insti which he calls I or institutions, competitive markets, he say, says, then follows on the institutional form. And then you get now and into the future, the, uh, the organization of networks of civil society activist groups and so on at a global level. So now he's not saying that these things uh, replace one another, but he's saying that it's a cumulative thing. So that the tribal form, when you have the birth of hierarchy, there will be elements of the tribal form that are both retained in and transformed by the institution of hierarchy. Likewise, he thinks that the markets then transform what hierarchies can do, and the evolution of the network form will therefore both have within it all these former forms, the T, I, and the M, uh, transformed with, to be parts of the new T plus I plus M plus N form. So, uh, so it's a cumulative progression, which is why it says T, I, M, N there at the top. Is it, is it clear what, people, what, he, what he's getting at, or is it expositional questions? I don't know. I mean, I, he, that's 3,000. Maybe he doesn't want to progress much further than one millennium out from now. <laughs> the semantic web, yes. Well, what's after? Could, I don't know. It could be something. Yeah. Well, so uh, one, of, one of Ronfeld's main points is to focus on, and the, the work he's done mainly is focused on tribes. Uh, he calls it the first and forever form. And what he argues, this is, this is sort of interesting in terms of the current uh, Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts, which has one of the, been one of the spurs for his theorizing. He's at RAND. He's interested in how you conduct warfare in tribal situations is that he says that as you break down one of these more advanced forms of organization, the tendency is to, for societies to fall back to the earliest form of organization. So tribal or kinship networks are kind of always present, he thinks, when there's a moment of social chaos or disruption, you end up retreating to that form, which has certain elementary uh, properties that make it very resilient under, to certain shocks. 
but may not, of course, allow them to, to develop other kinds of things that, say, network or industrial societies need. So I want to, um, to back up here because it's not clear to me in those earlier historicizations exactly how the transitions occur. Now, in Ronfeld's work, there is a, an attempt to theorize uh, how the primitive mesh or band network in a tribe turns to an early form of hierarchy in the, uh, in the primitive chieftainship. That he's so far focused most of his work on developing that anthropological connection. But more broadly, it's not clear to me that the transitions have been worked through. And I'm not sure, for example, that the market is a separate form than, than some of these other ones. So I wanted to just go back to some basic anthropology. I'm going to borrow here from Marshall Solon's work, um, uh, but who, who kind of draws from a lot of other people's works at the time, Colin Firth, uh, 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 Malinowski, a lot of the famous anthropologists in the 20th century. He distinguishes two basic forms of social exchange. These are actually reducible to a broader form, but we can distinguish them for now. And there's a relation between the two. The first is reciprocity. The second is redistribution or centricity. Um, and one of the relevant things here, if we're thinking about power, is that it may be that some of the distinctions between uh, network power and other kinds of power that depend on ordinary hierarchy is already present in the very early forms of social exchange. Uh, reci reciprocal exchange will depend on some kinds of standards, often simply nothing more than language, perhaps. But you can imagine there are various protocols or standards that allow that connection to happen. In the most extreme case that people, anthropologists find, you have uh, the case of silent barter or, or dumb barter or dumb exchange where two different groups that don't share a language or other forms will actually just lay things on a riverbank and retreat. Another group will come forward and lay a certain amount of other stuff on the riverbank and retreat. And if one group collects the other thing and then it goes away, you've had a trade. And if not, you don't. But that, that's, that's the most uh, unsociable form of exchange. You don't share many protocols or standards. And of course, to get any more advanced or developed forms of reciprocity, you need more and more standards. And so for some of the work that Karina was talking about yesterday in terms of how there might be network gatekeeping, in the formation and maintenance of protocols or standards and networks, you know, it's, it's going to go all the way back to very early forms of exchange that determine who can, who can do what with whom. In the redistributive context, it's not necessarily the case that you have the ordinary power of hierarchy, the ability of, say, the police to come and intervene, like Yochai was mentioning. Uh, but it's often the case you do that, where the, we don't have exit from uh, uh, such a hierarchy. So that the more ordinary form of power of one person directly commanding the will of another, we usually associate with these forms of centricity Reciprocity, I, I try to theorize as a form of network power, is distinct from that. We can think about that basic anthropological divide in terms of uh, a basic network typology. This is borrowed from Paul Barron's work. Probably people around here, this is like mother's milk to them. But he theorized in 64 for a RAND paper the different ways in which communication networks might be developed. This was precisely to avoid, I mean, if you're in this world where all the data you need passes through Washington, and Washington has a nuclear attack, you're in trouble. So maybe you should go for a distributed or a decentralized network of some, distributed network, not a decentralized network. Um, but this is the sort of basic typology I'm going to work with. People have questions about this? There's some sort of puzzled look. The first one you wouldn't really call a network, huh? That I, that I would leave to other people to. It's a network of a small end. Yeah. Because there's no, no possibility of feedback. So it's a very yeah. primitive. So how does network? Mm -hmm. It's a network. <laughs> Anything <laughs> that has no Okay, one and minus one. But why would there not be a possibility of feedback? Uh, because there are no loops. Why not? Something well, there are no arrows through. not there. Really. Well, anything that goes from the periphery to the center right. can come back. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. design a dual connection, mm -hmm. right? You could imagine that as like a, a, um, at the at the center you could have a, um, two parents maybe and there's a little node and then all the children <laughs> outside and there could be a lot of feedback even if you know you, it just depends on what the links are so if you well, say oh these no are the feedback in the cybernetic sense no 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 no, no, that's no. Be no no that's right that's right not in the cybernetic sense that's right that's right I mean actually bro broadcast. They call them networks, A, B, C, and they were called networks, and that's what they would look like. Yeah. So a tribal model, this is the stuff that Solens talks about, um, and that also uh, 
Peter Ronfeld stuff tries to theorize. You, you have a transition. Yeah, you have a transition from a primitive band or mesh network, which might be up to 150 people, but usually much less. That could be seen as a distributed network. Everyone in that community knows each other. There, it's often forms of consensus or uh, cooperative sharing, production, et cetera, et cetera. There, there may, may, there's often no role differentiation. Rank differentiation is not necessarily the chief who's deciding anything. Um, people go along as a kind of single unit, so to speak, or a single network doing what they will. And if people disagree, the usual thing they do is exit. So instead of using voice and there being a hierarchy of who gets to decide what or some kind of internal procedure for a decision, uh, there's usually these, 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 these bands remain small because splintering is the usual way that people voice disagreement. Um, there are various theories about how you get a transition from a band network to early chieftainship where there's primitive rank differentiation. Uh, one of the most common ones is that the form of ordinary exchange, the, rest of the reciprocal exchange that we saw here, reciprocity and redistribution, an unbalanced exchange where A gives a little bit more, usually food in this case, to B, than B returns, will mean that the difference is made up for in honor or loyalty in some way. And so you have a status economy. And some people have argued that you get early forms of hierarchy through forms of initially unbalanced reciprocity that mean that there's a push towards centricity. So you see this in the Melanesian societies where you have so-called big men societies or big men chieftainships. There's not a formal argument that this guy has to be the chief, but if he has a lot of food and he's distributing it, he has loyalty and he can often have his, his will imposed on the group as a, as a function of the unbalanced reciprocity. That's something I went over a little bit more in my paper. I don't want to spend too much time on it now. But here you can, but you can see why there might be a shift from one kind of tribal society to another, or both of them being in a kind of unstable relation with one another as an overall model. Here, I have to, yeah. So, the, the, I don't, yeah. It's my understanding there's no anthropological evidence for, for a lattice as a network, except maybe in residential structures where, where two dimensional space uh, constrains ties. And mm -hmm. stuff. But if it's kinship, it's not going to look like that. But what, what if it's just a primitive band? It's not necessarily a kinship network. So, you've just got 50 people who together wander the forest eating everything. Probably a caveman ground. And, you know, Duncan wants it. It's right. probably clusters with maybe certain kind of link structures, but they're going to be fully connected. It'll be fully connected, yeah. Um, you know, quasi clean. Very right. dense clusters. Okay, right. Something like it's not going to be a lattice. Now, okay, I, I didn't mean it to be a lattice. I meant just a, the idea of a distributed network so that all points are connected to every other point and there's no internal segmentation. So probably I shouldn't be using this. I, I was borrowing these graphs from Paul Brown just because I couldn't. This is my primitive effort. And it, it took me a long time, as I said, my first PowerPoint, so I have to apologize for that. Mm -hmm. but, but in terms of the tri a tribal uh, band as being a distributed network where everyone knows each other and which there's no role differentiation, do you think that that doesn't describe it? Right. OK, all right. right. So please, so, so, so then uh, excuse that. And, and I, yeah. So, but that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is not a completely connected network. That's right, 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 right. I see what you mean. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. No, no, no. That's right. It should, it should be, it should be, sorry, it should be this one, the polis one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Apologies. Yeah, yeah. I got that. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. I give you a specific example of a data set that does look like that. If you go look at the tarot exchange data, the classic tarot exchange, it's, it's a lot like that. It looks like that, this. That's right, but that's a trading. It's not exactly like that. That's right, but that's a trading network, and I actually was mistaken because I wanted to describe a band. And no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just to be, and it's, but it's spatial as part. Of spatial. It. When you, as soon as it's spatial, then the bar right. dies. No, no. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. That's great. Oops. <laughs> What's the time, by the way? Do you know what time it is? Past one. Okay. What's that? Ten minutes. Ah, okay. I, I only have ten minutes, so I'm going to go quickly. An ancient model. Um, I'm, I'm. This is the connected world of citizens. Each citizen had underneath him different within his oikos or his household different uh, uh, slaves or dependent family members. Uh, I'm not sure this is right now, but I wanted to try and get a multiplex network where you have 
each citizen is both a member in an equal and connected relationship with their citizens, but underneath him has dependents who aren't then for members juridically of the same network in the first case. That would be something like our ancient model. That's different from the I institution, for example, that Ronfeld theorizes, which is simply a hierarchical form. Uh, so this would only be in the classical polis. Uh, but th there, are, there are possible tensions or uh, contradictions in that model uh, going forward. But it, the, what I meant to get at this in this decentralized idea is that you might have, say, a form of government going out to uh, the lords of the oikoi, the, the household, the people who run the households. And then within the household, you have different people who are dependent on that person juridically. They wouldn't themselves be directly linked back to uh, the, the government or, the, or, or a central king figure. Um, as that model broke down in late antiquity, for reasons we can go into in the Q&A, if people are interested, you have a kind of feudal model. A feudal model, you either have anarchic feudalism, where the A's here are supposed to be lords. I wanted a multimodal network, but I didn't, didn't make it properly. But A's here are lords, and then the BCDs under them are serfs. And you get the rise of weak feudal monarchies, where you have weakly linked forms of lordship, very possibly for the same sorts of reasons that had the transition in the tribal societies, which is that one of the lords begins to differentiate himself, and oftentimes that was the beginning of early monarchy. The modern model uh, you have a combination of a state which through everyone passes juridically through a single point. There's no segmentation there. So you don't have a lord who is the person who channels your participation in the government before going on to another step. Everyone is directly linked through formal procedures. And so ignore this civil society economy. That may not be the right depiction. But you have a different kind of model that's not centrist uh, for, uh, for markets. And the difference here is that, for example, many people want to theorize the market as a separate form that emerges uh, and often is in contradiction with hierarchy. One thing I want to argue, and this is what I'm working on in a, in a book called The Invention of the Economy, which is uh, on the history of economic thought, is that the market model um, emerges once you have the vertical hierarchy without internal segmentation of the state. Because the forms of security that the state allows uh, mean that the forms of reciprocity, the A to B sharing like that, can shift from vice versa exchanges that are more, that are more, um, uh, more to the state of gift exchange, where people actually give gifts back and forth, and there's forms of reciprocity that way, to more forms of contract or market, because you can expect your contracts to be enforced. And you also don't have to essentially buy interpersonal security through making forms of uh, friendship, or what they called in ancient, ancient Greece, philia. You'd have, you'd have philoi, who would be your, your clients. You'd have a clientelistic network. Uh, as the state rises, it basically both supersedes and makes irrelevant those forms of, uh, of solidarity at the reciprocal level, which means that the forms of interpersonal exchange you get shift toward the market end of things, which helps to explain why you don't see as much market life in antiquity. That, that's, that's very condensed, but I can go through that if people are interested later. So what, what, how do we characterize the, mark, the modern model as a whole with these two different kinds of networks? One at the level of the productive sphere and the other at the level of the political sphere. I don't know. If we add networking technology to it, we have a certain kind of fantasy, which is that everyone is connected all the time. But in, this, is the, this is borrowed from Twitter. This is how Twitter conceives itself. Uh, and there's obviously some truth to that, but the internal uh, hierarchies of centricity are not depicted here, right? So you don't have, so the state part has dropped out of this picture, um, which makes me think that the network society reality is, is both potentially universal, it's decentralized, there are switchers who link up different parts of networks, not a, it's not a completely integrated network like with Twitter necessarily, oops, it's something more like that, and it's a question of, this actually looks more like the ancient model where you have certain people who organize the contributions of others, there's a segmentation. But here I think we have what, like what Karina was saying, a transient elite. So the people who are switchers or programmers may or may not have that as a juridical fact about their person. It may be as a fact about the form of the network constitution and theorizing how they get into that position and how they can be dislodged where we don't like the effects that they have is I think the challenge for a critical historical theory of network power. Thanks. So thoughts, recommendations, things to read. I mean, this is very much a work in progress. I love people's feedback. I mean, uh, yeah. It's an RFC. Was that? It's an RFC. RFC. It is definitely an RFC, yes, on multiple levels. Yes. Um, just a, a suggestion that might make 
this yeah. ambitious task a little easier for you is yeah. to perhaps think about um, political, economic, social um, as separate planes, mm -hmm. each with a network structure. Yeah. Um, and when you get reach throughs across the plane, right. those are efforts of power grabs exactly. or the, the basis for kind of fundamental alterations and in, in, invention. And invention. Exactly. Uh, trying to represent all of them in one right. um, is uh, flattens their effect. And what, what's nice about what you're doing is, you know, we divide our world into disciplines. So we give economics this one, and political science this one, and sociology this one, and, mm. and you recognize that's false. I mean, it's good for the right. task often of an intellectual problem, but in the representational sense, you want it's all three or four or five, right. or many you want. But don't try to Push right. all to one. Uh, well, but what about if you had all of the people, say, in some relevant social sphere as nodes in something? I mean, sort of like the stuff that, that Peter had is mapping the, uh, the Y, what was it the J win? The J win thing? Well, okay, right. And you had, and you, you could show the multiplexity, right? So at one level you say, okay, what's the political form here? And you could show centricity. And you say, well, what's the productive form here? And you could show reciprocal links that would be, say, everyone connected or, or maybe not, segmentation through someone. And you could... And you could the scale issue of their, there was a, their network was relatively small. It was a, it was a work right. network at one level. And right. it was 40-odd people. Right, right. But we didn't also right. have on that who's dating whom. Right. Uh, we don't have geography who lives where. Right. You know? So there are all kinds of other ways. And, and since you're trying to do this big historical Right. Um, a quick plug for uh, for Ronfeld, just if yeah. people aren't familiar with his work. He um, he actually started studying Al Qaeda in uh, 1994 um, mm -hmm. and began writing about them as a particular form of the right. dark side of networks, uh, well in advance of right. uh, uh, their rise uh, in, in Kenya right. in 1998. These, these spin these so, these segmented polycentric, right? They, they remember this. And this came out of work on social movements in the 60s, mm -hmm. actually. Interesting, you know, civil rights stuff was first diagnosed with spin networks, and then, then the, uh, the, the, yeah, anyway. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Oh, yeah. And uh, your patterns uh, made me think about the central place theory, you know, in geography, right. where you have uh, uh, central places which control places that are controlled by other places, larger. Right. And uh, uh, the transformation we, we see now, uh, it's um, uh, uh, an over, uh, overlapping of these kind of uh, uh, patterns right. because of the uh, uh, decreasing of the role of the study. Right. And so uh, I imagine that in social networks also, there's a kind of distance, not only geographical distance, it could be whatever distance, social distance, economic distance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would, I think that in your transformation of patterns, you could uh, search what is the role of decreasing mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the distance right. between people right. uh, evolving in this network. But I think it's a, it's a big, a, a key element in the in the communication society. So you mean the social distance? Say how many how many people are between someone and something someone else? Is it? Okay, fantastic. Yes, I um, when I first read this paper, it's, um, it's a strange feeling because um, <laughs> it covers some ground that I've been working on for a, a little while. And so I follow up from Woody's point about separated. Mm -hmm. One way in which you can do this. Yeah is to take uh, world's spaces of flows and spaces of places as two separate um, constructions of space, historically. Mm -hmm. And then if you put Castells in with Brodel to bring yeah. social time, right. you have spaces of places related to cyclical times. <laughs> and spaces, sorry, spaces of flows related to cyclical times, <coughs> a commercial process. And spaces of places related to territory which are really contingent times, so they don't have, mm -hmm. they don't have cycles, and, and there's an interplay between them. Mm -hmm. But my, um, that's just responding to, to Woody's point, but the, um, the main difference, uh, a main difference would be that instead of bringing, or as well as bringing networks into 
this very stages that you're, you're, you're using. Um, it's perhaps particularly interesting, and this is what we talked mm, about right, last right. time, but it's particularly interesting to bring networks into, into the transitions. That's right. the interesting part, is the actual transitions. Right. So the question is, uh, under what conditions, uh, under what human conditions can you predict that there will be a transition of a qualitative level, a, a major transition from, say, chieftains to states, from small settlements to whatever. Um, and one way of thinking about this, it's the, the only way I can think about it, but there, there might well be others, and that is the, the thing that's missing from this is cities. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing cities as multiple networks and the change in, in human experience between a band level and then a city, you have to define a city, but let's just say a concentration of a large number of a large amount of work. Um, that difference between those two uh, is immense as an experience. And therefore you can sort of, if you like, um, use a Metcalf type law, which would be, but it would be two times Met, uh, Metcalf, because it would be two times Metcalf, because if in, say, Mesopotamia you have a city that grows to 20,000, it's a very different experience. A lot of uh, potential for change um, via the amount of connections you've got there. You have, on the one hand, the potential number of links within the city, which is the Metcalf 20,000 right. square. Right. But the whole, the whole point of cities is, is that they are in networks, so and they connect to, they come in groups. And it's these other links outside the city that makes the city cosmopolitan that links up, and they are, they are like perhaps. Uh, they are weak links relative to the ones inside, but they're very important because of the, the different sorts of information that's coming in. So uh, what I use is a sort of uh, two times met, uh, Metcalf. Um, I balance the internal and the external links as equal since I've got no other, no other criteria to judge them, so I don't know that. Uh, and obviously what you, what you produce then is a model that prioritizes cities because that's the context in which there is the possibility of an experience to make qualitative changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sort of article... No, I think this is fantastic. I mean, one, one thing it would allow me to do is to drop the whole periodization, right? Because if, you, if what you have is the city as, as, as a, uh, a distinct form of social experience that then has a reorganizing effect on hinterland, like we, we, were, we were talking about this, then you don't have... You, for you, what's the difference between London in... 2000 or 2100 and early cities at earlier. Do you have a periodization scheme there or you don't have to, right? You could imagine that the cities themselves... Uh, 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 periodization is based on... Um, based on the urban geography, not on, on productive on, schemes it's, or... It's based on, on inventions, um, like the invention of agriculture, like the invention of the state, like the invention of the empire, and, uh, and the inventions, <coughs> they are qualitative changes then the argument is that they need an experience as such to, to, to enable qualitative changes. And I can only think of cities to give that situation. And therefore, it is a prioritized city. So there are, right. that, that, um, when you put spaces of clothes and spaces of places into it, right. the interaction of those two produces a periodization. Right. Um, but, um, that's, that's no, that's fascinating. That's that's yeah, yeah. I mean, very interesting indeed. In well, <laughs> your work made me think about time in a very different way because instead of the period, I, uh, different periods, is there a thought, or I mean, this is an open question, I don't know, how you would add time within a structure? Because one of the things that's most, to me, a hallmark of today's society is the time constants are so, so, so much shorter. So mm. that one can change the links, and, and we're not moving across periods right. within the period, or however you, right. you wish to define it. So showing the dynamics right. is, to me, probably one of the more interesting right. sorts of possibilities. No, I think that's right. And what Peter was saying, the transitions are where all the actions at. Absolutely. I mean, I think the the clunky stage theoretic form I have there is ultimately something to be discarded, like a crutch or something. It gets you walking. But um, um, how to depict and analyze those transitions? Uh, would, I think, make the time question uh, kind of go away to the extent that 
you'd, what you'd be showing is a dynamic that would then have the time answered, right? Mm, yeah. One of the concerns, not concerns, but thoughts is right. the, the concept of the dynamic equilibrium instead of static equilibrium. If I just take a snapshot of something that's actually a very dynamic process, or I slice it, or I average it, then I'm going to get very one picture. Right. But if that actually includes a lot of perturbation or dynamics, dynamism, that it is, is not necessarily visible, then that gives me a completely different picture. Right. right. Okay, the final comment, Phil and Manuel. David, um, to go directly to the point, mm -hmm. uh, I, by trying to um, map out an evolutionary theory of network society uh, throughout history, you are stepping in a minefield. Yep. <laughs> and I salute your courage uh, because, in fact, uh, if we don't take some intellectual risk, uh, we never <laughs> right, right. innovate. So right. that's the way to go. Uh, now, but about the substance, right. let me simply refer to an anecdote that tells us what I want to say more clearly. Um, years ago, after the publication of my book on the Network Society, I received a, a letter from uh, the archaeology section of the American Anthropological mm. Association. These are serious people yeah, who, yeah. Who, who do fossils right, and right, stuff like that. Right. They, they, they're not just your <laughs> uh, Dig things and, up. Yeah, and, and so they. They, they said, you know, uh, in fact, uh, we are very interested because we have been working for years in the history of antiquity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and in fact, you are right. Uh, all were network societies. Mm -hmm. But you are completely wrong thinking that this is only a contemporary form of right. society. Right. All societies are network societies, so your theory should be for all societies. Right. Well, thank you very much. I don't want to take that responsibility <laughs> with my answer. And, and in a short sense, that I don't look. The problem is your networks are not my networks. And uh, I feel very strongly that simply the formal structure of networks doesn't say much except in mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, unless you put the networks into the context and into the technology through which mm -hmm. the networks operate. And what I, I told all this is published now in a book uh, titled Connectivity in Antiquity, which is my debate yeah. with all these serious people, oh, well, and me escaping from the responsibility of <laughs> putting everything on networks. Um, right. My point is, you know, your networks and mine are, are not the same. Because what I'm talking about network society is society whose organization and forms and processes are based on the capability of operating a microelectronic based, digitally transmitted network technologies. And that changes everything. It's not another form, it's a qualitative change. And my example was, yes, in the 16th century, Latin America and Spain were a, a world economy in, intimately right. connected, right. and there was a network there, except that the network was, in fact, one link of one convoy of galleons once a year right. from Seville to Lima. Uh, right. And that's completely different than multi-layer right. interaction at electronic speed. Right. Right. So my point is, when, when Peter was saying before, right. uh, uh, that his periodization in terms of basic transformation, which I translate as transformation of technological paradigm, including the know-how of empires into a paradigm, that changes everything. And so my, my, my mm -hmm. reaction to, to your courageous effort is that <laughs> uh, you, you have to include right. the context and the technology no, that's right. to which networks operate, then make the transition to an evolution of the different forms of social organization. That's right. Uh, I should I should escape from responsibility for world historical theory by exiting the stage. You've got to engage with people, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.